God and for God's word. Pastor Franklin, the resident pastor of Kodesh Family Church Atlanta, comes your way with this refreshing and inspiring word that will motivate you to do your best for God. Join Pastor Franklin now as he ministers the word of God. chapter 4 verse 35 it says that say not ye that there are yet four months and then cometh harvest behold I say unto you lift up your eyes and look unto the fields for they are white already to harvest amen this scripture or this saying by Jesus explains a lot what is happening to many Christians or where we find ourselves. Jesus is speaking to us as you're speaking to them in those days. And he finds people who should be in the harvest field who are not in the harvest field. So he was telling them that don't say we have four more months before it is time for harvest. But just look around. The fields are already white. Those guys had a reason for not being in the field, thinking that well, it is not time for harvest. Today, our reasons may be different. It may be work, it may be schedules, it may be anything, but the problem is still the same. That Christians who should be in the harvest field, saving souls, are not in the harvest field. Christians who should be about soul winning are not doing anything to win souls. You know, I saw somebody sleeping. It's made by mind. <laughs> Please, if somebody is sleeping by you, say, we just started. We just started. Look up. Amen. Amen. Christians who should be in the harvest field are not in the harvest field. And that is the problem Jesus was trying to address. He says that look around. The fields are already white. So when there is, when fruits are ready and they are not harvested, they go bad. If you have a small garden in your backyard, maybe you've planted tomatoes and it gets uh, ripe and you don't go for it, before you realize it has gone bad. So when Jesus says that look around, the fields are already white. What he's saying is the harvest is in danger of going bad. Please stop playing with my sound. The harvest is in danger of going bad. Many people who could be saved and come into the kingdom are running the risk of going to hell because Christians are not going into the harvest field. God is looking for soul winners. People who would go into the field and ensure that the harvest does not go bad. That is the people that God is looking for. For a long time, Christianity has been a selfish, a selfish thing, if I could say that. We are happy we are saved. And our children too are brought up in the church. So we are okay. By the grace of God, if everything goes well, they would also be saved. But we don't look beyond our walls to save the next person. And God wants us to be soul winners. Win a soul. Bring somebody into the kingdom. That is what we need to be doing. The greatest thing you can do with your life is to be a soul winner. There is nothing that compares. Accounting, medicine, engineering, data, nothing compares with being a soul winner. Because when you come into this world, you come empty-handed. You struggle to gain a lot of things. A house, five-bedroom, with the side garage as I always say uh, an island in the kitchen 
Even though there is no sea, you have an island in the kitchen with marble or quartz around on, on the countertop, a big bank account. But when you are leaving, you will still go empty-handed. So, you come in empty-handed, struggle, beat yourself to acquire so many things, and then when it is time to leave, you still go empty-handed. But the thing that can go beyond that boundary of death is what you did for God. At the end of the day, all that matters is what you did for God. When you die, the only thing that remains is for heaven to hold a meeting for them to contemplate what did you use your life to do. That is the only thing that matters. And at that point, the souls you want your soul winning activities will count like gold because you didn't live a selfish life you led a life to bring somebody in everybody that has been saved you are saved because somebody made a sacrifice to come and speak to you that is how you became saved There is nothing in the human body that when you grow to a certain age, it makes you saved. For you to be saved, somebody needs to speak to you. Somebody decided to sacrifice, to sacrifice a holiday, to sacrifice some time, to sacrifice family time with the kids. Somebody made a sacrifice and that is why you are saved. And God is expecting us to do the same. We live in an age where many people, people are desiring things. Desire is so much that we are willing to do great things. People are doing two jobs. Not because, so in the past when people are doing multiple jobs it's because maybe you don't have opportunities to get like a, a very big job. So you are struggling and you are starting, so you are doing multiple things. But you have people who are well paid but doing two jobs because COVID has made it possible. I have two computers. I'm working. This one is at and This one is... I talk to these people a little. I talk to these people a little. No, this is the rev. <laughs> people are doing all sorts of things to get material things but the desire for soul winning is going out of the church. We are desiring the material things. It's good. Please, it's good. I'm not criticizing. Look, if you can work three jobs, work three jobs. What I'm saying is the church and Christianity is changing. We are focusing more on material things but something like a desire to win souls is nothing we think about. Like you wake, you wake up in the morning and you are just thinking about which soul can I win today? It, it almost doesn't happen. But where can I make some money? What stock? What NFT? What Bitcoin? What strategies in a system to make a few dollars? We think about that. Amen. And that is why I'm preaching this message. Reasons why you must become a soul winner. Amen. At least it may stir something in you. And consider becoming a soul winner. Amen. Amen. So, I'm just going through some points in the book. Um, I'll jump around. So, I'll give you the exact point number in the book. So, in case you get a book, you can find what I'm talking about. So, number one, it is a great commission. Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. It says that, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Amen. This scripture is popularly called the Great Commission. 
It's not in the Bible that it's a great commission, but the church calls it the great commission. The great commission means that the great command, the great instruction. Amen. And the, one of the reasons why it is the great commission is because it's the, the great reason why Jesus came. John 3, 16 to 17 says that what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. And verse 17 says that for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. That is the reason why Jesus came. So when he says that go into the world and teach and preach and save people, he's telling you the very reason that caused him to move from heaven to earth. And that is why it is a great instruction. This is why I came. And now that I'm leaving, this is the instruction I'm also giving you. That you must also save souls. You must preach the gospel. So a lot of the time we get confused. When the Bible says preach the gospel, it's not asking you to become a pastor. You don't need to become a pastor to preach the gospel. You could preach the gospel to your friends. Many people who are saved were not saved by pastors. They were saved by friends just talking to them, encouraging them, bringing them to church. That is the main work that God has saved. Amen. Amen. It is the great commission because it's you know, normally a person's last words set the course for the successes. What those who are coming after him should do. When Isaac was about to die, Jacob and Esau were fighting over his last words. The whole fight was about the words. Who gets the last words? When David was about to die, that is 2 Kings. Two, five to six or so. Or I'll check it if it's not that one. When he was about to die, he told Solomon that use your own wisdom. Use your own wisdom, but make sure. 1 Kings 2. Five to six. Make sure that Joab does not go down to the grave with his gray hair. No, don't let him die a natural death. He said, I'm, he said Moreover, thou knowest also what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me, and what he did to the captains of the host of Israel, and to Abner, the son of Ner, and unto Amasa, the son of Jetha, whom he slew and shed the blood of war in peace and put the blood of war upon his girdle that was about his loins and in his shoes that were on his feet do therefore according to thy wisdom and let his whore that is the gray head let not his gray head go down to the grave in peace so he has set the course for Solomon do anything you want to do but make sure this guy he doesn't die a natural death Say he will, he will sleep and die in his sleep. No. And Solomon killed him. He used wisdom to get him. He trapped himself. Amen. When Elisha was serving Elijah for many years, he was known as the person who pours water on the hands of Elisha. Everybody knew him. But he never knew the source to the anointing. He got the source or the key to the anointing in the very last words of Elijah. He followed him. The very last thing Elijah told him is that you have asked a great thing. But if you can see me when I'm taken away, you will get the anointing. So many years he never told him how to get the anointing. But the last words had the key. So when Jesus' last words 
on this earth is about go ye into the world. Teach, preach, save, baptize. That is the main thing. Because those were his last words. He had the opportunity to say the last thing before he goes. I mean, think about it. You are in a plane. And then the pilot announces. Fuel is finished. Whatever. Something has malfunctioned. We are now flying over the Alps. It's a mountainous area. Or we are flying over the Atlantic Ocean. We have 15 minutes to crash. And death is setting. There is no... There is no reception. Text is not working. But then they come to you and say that we have this box here. It's been designed to withstand any kind of crash. So we are going to give everybody the chance. Record a message. When we are dead and they find it, they can play it to your children. What message will you say? Will you talk about the food in the fridge? What, what about your dress? You will tell them the most important thing. Because you know you are about to die. You don't have any opportunity to help them anymore. So when Jesus is about to leave, and then he opens his mouth and says that, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son. That instruction is the great instruction. It's the instruction that we should follow. If you fail anything, you shouldn't fail the last words. And I believe that when we get to heaven, one of the criteria for assessment will be this one. Because this is the last thing he told you. Some of you husbands, some of us husbands here, <laughs> if you are traveling you leave a lot of instructions. But the last one, if you come back and it's not done, you say there is a problem. Say, but the last one I told you. So, but you told me this, but which one was the last one I told you? This is also the last thing that Jesus told you. That go and win souls. Amen. Amen. It is a very great commission. We need to tell people. We need to tell people God loves them. There are many people working, broken. They put on a strong face. They have tattoos. They look fearsome. But many are broken inside. We need to tell them that they don't need to go through life broken. We need to tell them that their sins have been paid for. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. Abortion, murder, uh, drug abuse, Whatever vice, whatever has been done before, we need to tell them it doesn't matter anymore. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. It says, that, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as red as what? Scarlet, they shall be white as snow. That is great news. Because I don't know about you, I have some scarlets. And if it will be white as snow, it is great news for me. And people need to know. People need to know that no matter how dark or how red the sin they have, there is opportunity in God for those that sin to be wiped away. Anything that has been done before doesn't matter. But they will not know if you don't go and tell them. They will not know if we keep quiet. That is why you must become a soul winner. That is why when you go out every day, you must look for opportunities to Say something to someone. God loves you. One day I went, to, I went for evangelism in, a, in this mall. I was talking to a lady. She has a shop. Then she says she's a pastor's wife. And then she was telling me something that had happened to them the week before. They went to Beaufort. To a, a park in Beaufort to witness. Then they saw this guy, Caucasian, with a lot of tattoos, piercing. You know, there's something when you see them, you want to pass the other way. You don't want any trouble. That kind of person. And they saw him there. So they were contemplating. Should they go and speak to the person or should they just find an 
a regular, more approachable person to speak to. It's almost like, would the blood of Jesus work for this one? Or should we go to somebody that the blood will work for? So she and the wife, the pastor, they decided to go to the guy. I mean, they were trembling because you don't know what. Look, I went to Athens to, to do evangelism in a mall. That day, if the guy had a gun, I think he would have shot me. He was so angry that I actually dared to tell him Jesus loves him. And he started from slavery. The white man has brainwashed us. And now we are preaching the white man's... He was was literally mad. Insulted me. Went away. Drove his car. Came back to where I was. Opened the window. Continued again. They moved off. And he was a normal looking (laughs) black dude. So when you see some with the... No. Even the normal looking people, look at what they are doing to me. Should I approach? So that was the situation they found themselves in. But they mastered courage to go and speak to them, to the man. When they approached the man, the first thing they said is, Jesus loves you. This big man just started crying. He started weeping like a baby. Then the man said, he decided to come to the park one last time. When he goes home, he's going to commit suicide. So he was just enjoying the park once more. That if he left and went to suicide. And then in that moment, they just come and say, Jesus loves you. And it just broke him. We need to tell them. We need to tell them that God loves them. They may not listen to you, but you need to say it anyway. And he said, you don't need to die in your sins. Your sins are forgiven. You don't need to carry your guilt. They are forgiven. Because Satan has people trapped by guilt. So you did this. You think you can be saved. The people in the church, they are clean. And people, <laughs> they, don't know, they don't know we are in the church. <laughs> they don't know we are also here. But, <laughs> but from the outside, they feel like, I mean, I, I, I cannot, I, I can't be saved. I mean, it's, it's not possible. And people need to hear the message that Christ Jesus came to die for them and everything has been paid for. The only thing that remains is for them to show up and claim what God has prepared for them. Amen. So, you need to become a soul winner because it is the great commission. Point number three in the book. You must be a soul winner because you were created to carry out the good work of soul winning. Amen. Check your neighbor if their eyes are. They wake up. How many of us know Peter Touch? Peter, yes. Peter Todd, the musician, he sings reggae. Oh, I'm trying to, do, do, do you know him? Okay. The young people know him. Uh, who, is, who is Peter? <laughs> so Peter Todd is a, is a famous reggae musician. And he, he, he sang a song. And part of the song says that everybody wants to go to heaven. But nobody wants to die. It's, it's almost like mocking the gospel message. So you, you believe in heaven. You believe heaven is the best place. But nobody wants to die. Well, I don't know his real intention for writing the song. So I can't say he was mocking. But it sounds funny. But when you think about it, there is some truth in what he's saying. It's a good question. If we really believe heaven is the place to be, why don't we just die and go? And when you think about it, Father, I said, it doesn't make sense that God is even keeping us here. Because you are sitting in heaven. Then you saw a man. He was dirty. He couldn't clean himself. He said, I need to clean him. 
And the only way to clean him to, was to sacrifice your son with his blood. And then your son comes to die. Man is cleansed from his sin. And you leave man in the earth where the, the death and the field is. So it's like you, you bath your son and you just are putting right back in the backyard where the, the mud is. He was in the mud like it rained. Then you go to the backyard. Say, ah, Micah, why are you so dirty? Come. Then you go upstairs and you bath Micah. Then when you finish, you go and put him right back in there. It, it doesn't make sense. There must be a reason. And the reason is Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Ephesians 2 verse 10. It says that, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had ordained before, had before ordained that we should walk in them. The reason why we are not extracted the moment we become born again is because there are some good works that we must do. God has ordained that you must do some works. The works is witnessing to people and helping others to come to God. Because God is like a father who has children who are about to be destroyed. And he's looking for help to bring everybody in. So it doesn't make sense for him to save you and just take you out. He keeps you here even after saving you. There's a chance you may even get into sin again. But you should help him to bring others back into the kingdom. That is the purpose. That is your purpose. That is my purpose. That is the purpose of the church. That we would win souls. Amen. Amen. It is a great tragedy. It's a great tragedy for a Christian to live life and try so hard and live just a righteous life. I never insulted anybody. I never slept with anybody who was in my husband or wife. I never did any evil. And you are happy, you are holy, you are righteous. But you are useless Christian to the kingdom. How does your righteousness help the kingdom? I mean, yes, you never, you never committed any adultery or fornication. How does it bring somebody to God? If God was just looking for people who never committed fornication, what about the people who are dying? Who is going to bring them in? God may be more interested in you saving people than your righteousness, which the Bible already says is like filthy rags. I'm not saying go and sin, no. I'm saying that <laughs> I'm saying if your only goal is a Lord, I'm going to stay holy. How does it benefit the kingdom? What does it do for God? When he has people who are dying and he needs people to be saved. And you are there, Strau, I never insulted anybody. I never gossiped about anybody. I was never jealous when I saw the person wearing that shoe. It, it doesn't help the kingdom. The good works we must do is what helps the kingdom of God. To save souls. And you have friends who may not be Christians, if you can overcome your own personal self-consciousness, sometimes we don't want to be insulted. We don't want people to laugh at us. We don't want people to mock us and call us, oh, spiritus, oh, pastor. You don't want people to laugh at you, so you don't open your mouth. But if you would decide to speak to your friends, some of them would hear. And there are some people you are not the one who has been designated to bring them in. You just become part of the chain. Just like some of us. The first person who spoke to you about Christ, you probably didn't listen. Maybe it took 20 people. So it was like a chain of people. But the 20th person is the person who has been designated to bring you in. But number 15 and number 16 should come 
so that number 20 would work. So forget about saving the people and be more focused about telling them what God has done for them. The job is to tell them. Bible says that a sower went out to sow seeds. All you need to do is to sow the seed. Leave the growing of the seed to God. But people need to hear. Amen. Amen. So, point number three is you must become a soul winner because you were created to carry out the good work of soul winning. Amen. Amen. Number four, you must be a soul winner because these are the real numbers in the book. You must be a soul winner because soul winning gives great joy and energizes Christians. You must be a soul winner because soul winning gives great joy and energizes Christians. Luke number 10, Luke chapter 10, verse 1 to 3, and then verse number 17. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Amen. So in the very first part, you see Jesus about to send out the 70. And in verse 2, he gives the reason. He said that the harvest is plenty, but there are no laborers. The reason why he was sending them out is to go into the harvest field and bring in the harvest. The reason why he was sending them is for them to go out and win souls. The harvest is the harvest of souls. So that one is established. He sent them out to win souls because people are ready to be saved and brought into the kingdom. The Bible says that they went and they returned with great joy. Anybody that has gone soul winning on outreach, you will confess. When you come back, you have a certain unexplainable happiness. Like, Nobody has given you money, but there is this joy that is bubbling inside of you. And sometimes for days you are just singing. Like you are just so happy. You are singing songs, you are happily moving, doing your stuff. It comes from soul winning, working in the harvest field. That is the source of true joy. True joy comes from obeying God and working in the harvest field. Many people are looking for joy from all sorts of places. Some are looking for joy from marriage. Some are looking for joy from uh, their career. Some are looking for joy from the government. That's a hopeless one anyway. (laughs) People are looking for joy in relationships. Somebody who may not be married is looking for joy. I think, oh, if I get that person to be in my life, my life will be complete. And yet there are, there are people who have married. They've married Christians and they realize that the person cannot make them joyful. So all your life you are there thinking, oh, if I just get, oh God, help me. If I can marry and then you marry the person and realize that it's a mirage. The joy is not in the person at all. And some, 
Sometimes the difference between what was expected and the reality causes heartbreak. Even the day of the wedding, when you go on the honeymoon, and you wake up in the morning and the makeup is off. Have you, have you seen that? Uh... No, there was something on Facebook. Like they've shown somebody who is no, no, no. Uh, a lady who has dressed up before and after. If you see the after, man, the, if they show you what was before. Or maybe you met the guy, think, oh, this is a guy who has a potential to earn a lot of money. And after marriage, you realize that, no, it's not like that at all. <laughs> If you are counting up on his ability to make money to give you joy, realize that it's not going to work. Amen. Many people are looking for jobs, thinking it will complete them. But I, the reason why I know your joy does your your job is not giving you joy. So you're always looking for vacation. <laughs> If the company gave you joy, nobody would go on vacation. If the company satisfied everything, why would you even go on vacation? You will you stay working for the rest of your life, never taking vacation. But even after three months, you are looking for time off. You want to talk to your supervisor. But the thing to just started. Amen. True joy. True joy. Pure joy comes from obeying God and doing what he says. If you go to Psalm 4 verse 7, David says that you have filled my heart with joy which is beyond what they are called and they are wine. Let me say it well. Say that thou has put gladness in my heart more than in the time of their corn and their wine and their wine increase. That means that you've given me a joy which is more than the joy that comes when the salary is paid. And man, when the salary is paid, there is joy. When you open the account and see that it has landed. But David is saying that you've given me a certain gladness which is more than what comes in the time of corn and wine. So many people are depressed. But your life would be so much better if you would venture into soul winning. Because anybody that talks to people about Christ, even when they insult you, when you are leaving, you are happy. It's, no, it's amazing. I went, to the, I went to the mall. A Nigerian man, he insulted me from head to toe. He doesn't know anything about me. So you young guys, how you are doing the church, you are taking my... I said, Master, you don't even know me. You don't, you don't know whether I'm paid by my church. Oh, he didn't listen. He, when he finished, I said, thank you, sir. And I walked away. But I was happy. <laughs> it is only so winning where somebody can insult you and you are happy. That is the source of true joy. If you begin to talk to your friends, just start broaching the topic. God loves you. Your sins have been paid. Start talking to them. So the joy we are talking, it begins to become more permanent in your life. You become happy constantly. Many are believing in things for their joy, but there is nothing on this earth that will satisfy. Everything in this earth is cyclic. It just keeps going and never ends. Ecclesiastes is what? Oh, Bible scholars. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 6 to 8. 1, verse 6 to 8. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing. You can go to the mall and walk and look at all the beautiful things. Your eye will never say, I'm tired. Nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that has been is that we shall be. And that which is done is that we shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Amen. So, and other place, it says that the sun rises in the east, sets in the west. The wind blows from the north, then goes to the south, then it starts all over again. That is the world. 
If you are trust, he said, the sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasted to his place where he arose. The wind goeth towards the south, and turneth about unto the north, and it welleth about continually, and the wind returneth according to its circuits. Anything in this world has that cycle in it. It, it doesn't satisfy. That's why when people do drugs, they are high for a while. When it goes down, they need to go get more drugs. If you are getting satisfaction by sleeping with many ladies, you realize that it used to be a time that one person would satisfy you. Before I realize, you need two, you need three, you need multiple people, different people. Then you're like, oh, even the African Americans are not satisfying you anymore. Now you need to add Asians, you need to add different people. <laughs> Uh, and very soon none of the species on earth will satisfy you 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 did aliens (laughs) amen I mean people who drink alcoholics they start from small you hide the bottle you take a, 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 a thought it used to be okay. Then I said, oh, you, you increase it a bit. You increase it a bit. Now, the whole bottle doesn't satisfy. Or you move to something else. Oh, smell off is not too hard. Let me get some rum, coconut with alcohol inside. Or let me get some what? Black label. There's a, something called black label. Is it red label? Black label and there's white label. Look, it will not satisfy. The only thing in this earth that gives permanent joy is working for God. That is why people work all their lives. Then they get to a certain age and they begin to ask the question, what is the use? And there's a very good name for it. It's called midlife crisis. The doctor uh, or doctors or sir, they've come up with a name because it didn't happen to one person, it happens to a lot of people in the population. You may work, give your life to corporate America, give your life to secular things, but you will get to a point you begin to ask a question What is the use? Be- what are all these? Because you served them for 30 years, then one day they just decide to let you go. What is the purpose? Even when you needed to go for your brother's event, you didn't go because you were working for the company. They will get up and one day they fire you. What is the purpose? The joy comes from working for God. And if you see that scripture, the, uh, the Luke scripture, the verse 17, they said that even, they said, and they returned with joy saying even the devils are subject to us when you start obeying God to step out in so winning you become elevated before they went these devils were not subject to them but when you decide to speak to people devils become subject to you because the devil that you can cast out of that person cannot harass your life you have authority over that that type of devil A lot of people are harassed. Demonic harassment. If you would win souls, a lot of them will run away. Because when you step out to win souls, devils will become subject to you. Amen. Amen. And the last one I want to share. There's something happening to my sound. The last one I want to share is you must become a soul winner because soul winning generates divine support and protection so winning generates divine support and protection <clears throat> so in life people are willing to pay anything for the source of joy in their life whether it is a expensive xbox video game or it is a car, or it is some type of cable subscription, 
or it is buying a very expensive shoe. That even when they are wearing it, they are afraid. So they wear it once a year. But it brings them joy. Or it's a dress, a very expensive, just uh, I need to have it to satisfy my soul. People will pay top dollar for what gives them joy. People are committed to the things that brings them joy in life. And if you go to Luke 15 verse 7, Luke 15 verse 7, it says that, 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repents more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Verse 10 also says that there is joy in the presence of God and the angels. Verse 10. Likewise I say unto you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Everybody needs a source of joy. Even God and heaven need joy. And the joy comes to them when a person is saved. So when you become a person who engages in soul winning, you become a joy contractor for heaven. Because when they see you, the activities you are doing is what is bringing them joy. I bet you you can read the Bible from most... uh, from Genesis to Revelations, you will not see a lot of places where it says that this thing made God joyful. You will not see that angels are jubilating. When you are a soul winner, all the angels like you. Because you bring them joy. You bring them joy. And people will pay anything to maintain the source of joy in their life. It could be money. A very high subscription. Maybe buying all season tickets for Atlanta Braves. It may cost a fortune. But it, it gives me joy. To be able to go, I'll pay for it. Or yours may be some nice vacation in a very exotic place. It costs an arm and a leg, but that gives you joy. Yeah, it gives you joy. You may not even have money to pay the rent, you will go for the vacation. Because that is your source of joy. And and when heaven is also thinking about people they will be committed to those who bring them joy because when they look at this one say oh this one they are always asking me for things give me give me give me give me but this one ah when I see the person I am happy because the person is trying to win souls they are working in the field that will guarantee you divine support for life and anything that you do because God is interested in maintaining that source of joy. A lot of people go to God, they are always asking. Just like your people, maybe back home, you have friends, they are those who always call you for things. When you see the phone number, you don't, your phone is ringing, you don't want to pick it. You don't want to pick. But when, there are some that when you see it ringing, you are happy. Even if they ask you anything, you are happy. You just want to talk to them. It's the same with God. There are people who, when God thinks of them, about them, it gives him joy. Because they are doing things that bring him joy. I haven't seen anything in the Bible that says that heaven and the whole of heaven, God and the angels jubilate over that thing. It is so winning. It is the winning of souls. I encourage you to become someone that heaven thinks of as my source of joy. It will bring you divine support. John 15 verse 2. John 15 verse 2. 
So every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. That is God. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth that it bring forth much fruit. God is interested in making sure that the branch that is bearing fruit is kept. <laughs> no devil will touch you. If you are a soul winner, if you are somebody who is sold out on God to win souls, he will protect you. He says that the branch that beareth fruit, he purges it. Why? You purge it, you prune it so that it gives you more fruit. The branch doesn't need to think about pests. It doesn't need to think about disease. It doesn't need to think about uh, breaking. When there's a storm, it doesn't need to think about whether I'm going to break. Because God is the one that is supernaturally keeping that branch. Become a soul winner. It will guarantee divine provision for your life. It will guarantee divine protection for your life. So when you win souls, you are directing your love towards God. So one of the things, one, the, the greatest love you can show me, if I say you see my children, maybe JJ, she's running and she's going into danger. Maybe there's a cliff. She doesn't understand. And she's moving and playing towards that cliff. And where I am, I cannot run to, to save her in time. But if I see you run to save her, that will be the greatest love you can ever show me. Because that is my child. And if there is any soft spot in my heart, you will automatically be in that place. Because you saved my child. I mean, mothers, if somebody saved, your child is moving towards fire. When you realize it, you realize that even if you run, you can't save it. Save the child. And then somebody goes and picks up your child. That person you will love forever. And it's the same with God. Those who are working to save his children who are perishing, he loves them. Psalm 91, verse 14. 14 to 16. 91, 14 to 16. So that because he had set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Who? The person who has set his love on God. Set your love on God. Decide to save someone. Decide to talk to people. If you want to enter into God's protection, God's plan, God's, all the things that has been described, it comes from setting your love on God. And there is no way better to set your love on God than to decide to help save a child of God that is about to be destroyed. Amen. I hope you've been blessed. We'll continue next week. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for <coughs> for tonight, sorry, <coughs> for this morning the chance to look into your word. May we become soul winners. May we be people who just tell people, sow seeds in the lives of people. That when you think about us, we will bring you joy. And that you favor us. Help us to understand the message. Help us to do what is needed to change our lives to be soul winners. On that day when we appear before you, may we appear before you with souls that we want, people we could point to, the 
say that through my efforts, this person came into the kingdom. Help us that would obey this great commission to win souls, to win them at all costs, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. And if you are online with us, or you are here, and you need to give your life to Jesus, I'm going to give you the opportunity to give your life to Jesus. Bible says that you must confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you must believe that God sent him to die for you. These two things would bring salvation to a man. So we are going to say a prayer. If you are in that position where you want to give your life to Jesus, say it with your whole heart and you will be saved. Or you want to just rededicate your life to Jesus. Since you gave your life to Jesus, a lot of things have happened which puts you at a great distance from God and you want to come closer. You can also say the prayer and your life will be restored and renewed today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me. I accept the free gift of salvation. Come into my life. Make me a child of God. From this day, I belong to you. I am heaven bound. In Jesus' name. If you gave your life to Jesus or you dedicated your life to Jesus, you can always reach us on the number that is showing on the screen. 470-377-2963. 470-377-2963. You can call it. Somebody will pick it up. Somebody will return your call. Amen. God bless you for listening to this message. Subscribe to Kodesh Atlanta on Facebook and YouTube or reach out to us by calling or texting the number plus one four seven zero three seven seven two nine six three for more information and upcoming events. Thank you and stay blessed.